In September of 2014, I began my coursework towards a PhD in art education at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Due to circumstances, I was unable to finish that PhD. But this is what I have written for my qualifying exam. I call this Emile's Classroom, the Use of Nature and Art for Education for the Individual by Nathan Kilps. The abstract. Individualism is very important for a person's place in the world. Understanding what makes up an individual, their strengths and weaknesses, influences the relationship between the individual and the world. In order for one to understand individuality, they must reflect on it and address it in a context where it can be addressed uninhibited. Society often does not allow for uninhibited reflection of one's individuality. Therefore, in order for one to reflect and better understand their individuality, they may need to be removed from the influences of society. Nature could be an optimal place for individuality to emerge and be cultivated. If nature provides such an environment for individuality to be fostered, it may prove beneficial for, it to, for its inclusion in the general United States public education. Such an education could be used to better prepare students for their places in society and the world because they would be, have a better understanding of how and where their faculties could be best applied. Furthermore, art may provide a useful means for reflecting on and developing the, recon the recognition of individualities. Art, because of its expressive properties, could provide students with the means to address th their emotions, thoughts, interests, connections, and other things related to their individuality. Art paired with engagements in nature could ultimately provide an added and albeit valuable area of content in general United States public education. Introduction. Growing up with engagements in nature. Experiences with natural environments have been a part of my life as far back as I can remember and before. I was born in northern Wisconsin in a town called Ashland and brought to my first home in Marengo, Wisconsin. Marengo was an extremely small town of less than 400 people and was engulfed by forests. I was too young to remember, but I have, been, I have seen pictures of myself as a baby in the arms of my parents as they hiked along wilderness trails such as Copper Falls State Park, not far from Marengo. My parents have also told me of a friend of theirs who was an avid walker who would often come and pick me up to take me with her when she went. From the time I was old enough to walk, my parents and grandparents took me camping in Dork County, Wisconsin. When I was three years old, we moved to East Moline, Illinois. Next to our house was a large forest. Much of my childhood was spent playing in the forest next to my, next to my house, making up names for the different parts of the forest and imagining I could talk to the animals. Even as I got older, my friends and I would make biking and hiking trails, forts, and challenge ourselves to see how far we could explore. Our church was, would even take outings to hike and camp in the state parks. While we were living in Illinois, my family would go back to Wisconsin to the same campground in Door County every year. Much of my time was spent hiking up and down the lanes through the woods. The hikes started, the hikes started with my family when I was younger. But as I got older, the hikes included the friends I made. When my family moved back to Wisconsin, this time to Two Rivers, much of my time was spent with my friends playing at the beach or running around in the woods in, in, at Point Beach State Park. Through my college and graduate years, I spent much of my time hiking, biking, and doing whatever outside. During the summers, my friends and I would go for extended hikes, either tent camping or hammock, hammock camping for multiple days. We became so avid that we would even go in the middle of winter in sub-zero temperatures. To this day, when I go home to visit my parents, one of the first things my mom asked me is if I would like to join her and Zelda, her miniature schnauzer, for a hike. Slowly, I began to examine what drew me to hiking and what it did for me. Despite any trials or challenges from bugs, injuries, weather, or not having anyone to go with, the desire to be in natural environments has overcome any, any of those negatives. My desire to be in nature and natural environments 
and spend an extended time in Washington State was so strong one summer that despite having no one to go with, I hopped on a plane with one backpack, rented a car, and drove into the mountains and stayed there for 10 days. While on my trip to Washington State, I documented my thoughts, talked to people, and did what some would call soul searching or finding myself. I began developing a question pertaining my engagements with nature. What could possibly drive me to go to such great lengths to be in natural environments? I found it interesting how much engagement with nature have been a part of my life and began to contemplate the role it exactly played. I knew hiking and camping had a lot, a lot of meaning for me because it was the setting for a lot of my activities with friends and family. But until recently, I didn't realize the breadth of natural environments influence on my life. Knowingly, I went hiking and camping to get away, but I never took the time to ask what getting away meant or what it did. Many times I went hiking because I felt stressed, but just as many times I went when I didn't. I was drawn or driven to be in nature. I knew when I went, I could feel myself decompress, but what I didn't realize was what the decompression meant. What I came to realize is decompression meant allowing me to be me. For example, when I go to a shopping malls, I must walk with certain considerations, certain, certain conducts such as walking, talking in a manner that does not disturb others, boundaries pertaining to where one can go, where things should be, what can be touched, and respects to other people's space all become constraints to one's individuality. These are not necessarily bad things and in, in a societal context are perfectly appropriate. But for me, the crowds, noise, sights, smells, urgencies, and abundance of things that are placed as to influence buyers leaves me feeling exhausted and irritated. The feeling I get when, I, when in malls could be equated to a constant fight or flight response. In essence, navigating social situations are a succession of stimulated reactions. All of my being, physical, mental, social, emotional, and spiritual, are divided and challenged by the abundance of stimulation. Opposedly, I enter the woods and get farther away from anything that is human-made. The sounds, shapes, smells, colors relax me. Instead of stimuli that requires a certain response that must be navigated, the stimuli of the woods comes unsolicited and without effort. Over time, I would take the focus I felt while in the woods and break down what it was that was happening to me during my time in the woods. I noticed instead of dozens of things that were constantly going on in my head simultaneously, the commotion of multiple voices would align into one. I came to realize that the voices were my senses. The constant and erratic stimulations are present in today's everyday life. Whether it be sounds of cars on pavement, buzzing of lights, flashing of screens, chatter of people, the textures of walls and floors, the vibration of foams, or the smell of whatever cleaning products were used or nearby restaurants cooking, all became overwhelming for my senses. When hiking in the woods, the stimulations are not fragmented, but all connected. The rustling of leaves in the trees all makes sense, both literally and metaphorically. When you see the leaves rustle, you hear them. Feel the air that moves them. Smell the scents the winds pick up from them, and even taste it in the air. All the senses are received in receiving information for the exact same experience, which culminates in our imagination or conception of a whole experience. In this case, the disparate information all worked at the same, same sim symbolism, conception, or imaging. You don't have to pick or choose how to define the rustling of leaves because it is a full sensory engagement. All senses are in tune to the same thing. Having your senses trained to one stimulus provides the opportunity to develop sensitivity. Every disturbance becomes amplified. Instead of having to discern between multitudes of conflicting stimuli, there is only the woods that it is a network of everything that resides in it. It is blatant when a smell, taste, sound, touch, or sight does not belong to the woodland environment because of its direct opposition to the woods' harmony. Depending on where you are, trees can all grow vertically, 
Foli foliage can all make the same sound. The muted colors are vibrant in their subtlety, and the smell and taste of the air is clean. The continuity of the forest makes it easy to recognize inorganic shapes, erratic sounds, too bright colors, and smells and tastes that don't belong in the air. Furthermore, the need to conduct myself in a manner particular to a given situation vanishes. In my life, as I am sure it is with others, there are pers personas which I have had to assume while working as a student, as a teacher, or generally in public. While in the woods, there is no prescribed way of behaving. I could sleep where and when I wanted to sleep, eat what I wanted to eat, and do a host of other things that I could not do in society. I could live according to my own preferences instead of in accordance to socially dictated conduct. Let me make my own decisions. During one hike with two friends, I made the comment, I needed this. Although a seemingly insignificant phrase, it was one of the most sincere moments of my life. My friends and I had gotten in the woods and had been hiking silently for a good amount of time when the overwhelming feeling to say, I needed this came out. To my surprise, my two friends replied, we know. They had recognized not only that I did in fact need to go hiking, but that throughout the hike, as one of my friends observed, you are becoming more like yourself again. A shift I hadn't even recognized in myself. This interaction hit me profoundly and was something that my friends and I talked about at length throughout the hike. The event has since become a part of what we, my friends and I, think about when we hike. Halfway joking and halfway serious, knowing the gravity of what I, what I needed this means, the phrase has become a saying when the three of us go hiking together. It reminds us of the importance of what hiking does for us. Until recently, I thought that my experiences were isolated. Current research is showing that experiences like the one I have described are more prevalent than the, I had once thought. Scholars across many disciplines, psychology, landscape, landscape architecture, sociology, and others, are investigating the effects of being in natural environments and how they affect the human body and in cognition. This paper will introduce the idea of education for the individual, define what it is meant by individuals and why it rec why its recognition is important, establishing a framework for educating the individual, addressing how engagements with nature could be used for education for the individual, and propose a possible way of assessing such assertions through the use of the arts. Do more, do better.